Just, just louder, shift louder. I can't see loud in my back. Today is the 17th of January, 1444. I'm going to ask you to be louder because uh, I can't hear it properly. Yep. The lawful and unlawful affairs are here. On the point of Abu Abdullah and Muhammad bin Bashir, Prophet Muhammad, who said, I heard the message of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying, Surely Allah is clear and Allah is clear. And to see the two are found in the same language, that may, that may not be people who do not have knowledge of. So the men who abstain from the doubt of others are saying in the truth and the summer. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praises due to Allah and may peace and blessings be upon his messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Did you date the class, then, my dear brother? No. Yeah, um, tonight is the fifth class, and we are on hadith number six. From the Arba'een and Nawawiyyah. Forty hadiths of Imam and Nawaw. Those 42 hadiths, as we said, is are more than 40. There are 40 plus principles. And tonight we're going to deal with one of those principles, which we have stated before. It is actually one of the ahadith that Islam rotates around. All the ahadith from one to six, Islam rotate around these ahadith. This hadith talks about the ahkam, halal and haram, and there's a third category, and that is the things where the people are in doubt of. So this hadith tells us that the things that we deal with in terms of relation to Islam is of three categories. And those three categories are mentioned here are to be that is halal, which is clear, such as eating from the camel meat, from the animal meat, and for example, eating from the fruits, all of that clear. Everybody knows that bananas halal. They know the fruits are to be halal. So that's clear for everybody, whether it's the general or the people who are learned. Second category is the haram, which is clear. Like, for example, drinking wine, fornication, and eating the dead animals, or eating animals which are not permissible to eat. <coughs> also, incest, making sexual contact with mother, part for the, with the sisters, all of that is to be known haram to everybody, whether they are the one who are general, lay people, laymen, or the one who are learned. But there's a third category where the Prophet Sallallahu he said, وَبَيْنَهُمَا أُمُورٌ مشبهات or مشتبهات Two narrations. Doubtful matters. Those doubtful matters, he said, لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس. So those 
things they are we call it the gray in english area the gray area it's not the uh, white and black gray area the gray area in between and he says here yeah, so many people they don't know about it. he didn't say everybody they don't know about so for some people they are not doubtful matters they are white and black so for the scholars the learned people they will know so if i for example a general layman comes to eating let's say a hyena now he for himself didn't know that the hyena halal or haram so this is called doubtful he doesn't know but for somebody who's learning he has studied came to the classes read a book listened to a sheikh he will know hyena is haram or halal haram halal haram haram halal haram haram halal haram haram anybody says halal subhanallah so none of you is learned people it's halal 100% no one says haram so you learn today so now hyena from now on is clear cut for you halal Hadith Jabr, that he, the companions were eating the hyena and the Prophet وسلم, looking at them. So it's one of those animals which has got the jaws stronger than the jaws of any other animal that would crush the stones. The lions can't do that. The hyena can crush the stone. The strongest jaw. Google it, Google it. Huh? Strongest jaw amongst the animals, the hyena. He crushes bones because he goes to the leftovers. The leftovers are bones. So he has to have strong thing to, you know, eat it. And Allah made it a hunt for us. Halal. I haven't tasted it myself, but it's halal. So, so many people do not do. So many people, some people, they will know. Those doubtful matters is the whole hadith is all about. <laughs> He's not talking about the clear cut halal, not the clear cut haram, because nobody's going to have a dispute regarding eating banana halal haram. Nobody's going to have a dispute to eat chicken halal haram. They will have a dispute regarding hyena, regarding crocodile, halal or haram. Mm, I don't know. Think about it. Ask at the end of the class. Halal or haram to eat crocodile. Elephant, halal or haram. Think about it. Okay. Now we're having tossing coin. Halal, haram, haram, halal. <laughs> as long as the person can't say these things unless he knows. But in front of a teacher, he could say wrong things because he will correct you. Fine. Now, the Prophet he said, فَمَنِ شُبُهَاتِ فَقَدِ دِينِ He who saves himself from the doubtful matters, then he has safe regarding his deen وَعِرْضِ And his عرض, his honor. His deen, which is to do with Allah. So he's safe regarding going into the haram of Allah. His irb, that means regarding the people. Also, he will save himself from going into things which will entail that you have wronged somebody. So you haven't done wronged Allah, nor you have wronged somebody. Keep away. Ittaqi. Ittaqi means keep away. Not to sit beside it. Uh, you have to keep away. It's not, you have to put a shield between you and that matter, that doubtful matter. He who does fall into the doubtful matter had fallen into the haram. You might say, how can it be? Let's say that the hyena example. I didn't know it's halal haram. Then I said, let me eat it because I think maybe it's halal. Then I found out it is to be halal. So how can it be that I have fallen into haram when I've eaten halal? Yes, because you have made your religion as a gamble. When you went to eat the, the, the hyena meat, you didn't have any concern, whether it's like haram or halal. And you just saying that, let me just play the dice here. Yeah, the Russian roulette, could be, could be right, could be wrong, it doesn't matter. Even if you hit the target, it's gonna be what? Sinned. And that's why any person say something out of no knowledge, he will be sinned regardless if he hit the correct answer or not. Do you understand that? If you dare yourself onto the fatwa, you dare yourself onto the helpher. 
Because this is deen. I'll give you an example, which you agree with me and everybody will agree. We got a tablet in front of me. This tablet, it could be a healthy tablet and it could be a poison that will kill your heart. Would you eat it? Would you chance and gamble with your life and say, it's 50 for this. let me take it, it could be healthy. Would you? This tablet either is the elixir that will give you immortality or it will kill you straight away. Would you eat it? No way. This is worse. When you start gambling regarding your deen, let me eat it. Well, we'll know later on halal or haram. So he who comes into the doubtful, the gray area, he has fallen into haram. And then the Prophet Sallam, he gives the example of that, that everybody can understand. And remember, he's talking to, about, to people who are nomadic, people who are Bedouins, people who are attached to their camels, attached to their ca uh, the, the, the cattle. So he talked about now shepherd grazing his sheep. So he says, Karai, Yara Haul al Hima. Like a shepherd grazing his sheep close from the border of a, an area belongs to a king, a landlord who is in position. That means if you had your sheep gone into that area, you'll be punished, a severe punishment. Okay, so as soon as you go into that area, you'll be punished. So you are now seeing that area and you belong to such and such king. God knows what's going to happen to me from his soldiers. If I had my sheep, some of them, one of them, even one of them went in his land. What would you now do? You graze the sheep, what? Far away. You're far away. Because you, you don't know if that one of them is going to go there and you're going to be in prison for a lifetime because of that king is tyrant. So here the Prophet is giving an example that if you are grazing your sheep, graze it in the land which you are 100% for you, halal, don't graze it next to a land. If you go, one sheep goes into it, then you're going to be punished, a severe punishment. Then he said, <laughs> For every king, he's got an inviolable area, area which belongs to him. Nobody's allowed to touch it. Belongs to him. The kingdom that Allah Azza wa is telling you, you're not allowed to jump into it, is to violate his inviolables. To make haram. That's not allowed. This posture, you're not allowed to graze your sheep into it. You have to be as far as you can from it. That's the whole hadith is all about. To do about that falling into the doubtful matters. Because you don't know, even without you knowing, your sheep might go in that land because you did not pay attention. Now, he then he says, <laughs> Now he's going to talk about something that would make sure that you will graze away from this, that for land. And that is in your body. That is in your body. The one which is you should concern about. The one which will either take you to paradise, and if you don't look after it, it takes you to hell. Very little is a piece of flesh into your body. If it's to be correct, healthy, then the whole body is healthy. And if it's to be corrupted, then the whole body is corrupted. It is the heart, al qalb. Now, Abu Hurairah, the race, he says, that the heart is like the king and the limbs are like the soldiers. Now, so if the king is healthy and good, then the soldiers will be good and vice versa. If the king is bad, then the soldiers are bad. But actually, this is the heart, even more important than the king. It's not a king, it's a heart. You must have heard about a king who is tyrant, corrupt, yet some of his soldiers are what? A good, true or not? You must have heard about a king who is very good, yet some of his soldiers are what? Bad, but not in the heart. The heart is good, everybody is good. The heart is bad, 
everybody's bad. There's no such thing, one limb is good. So it's even more important than the one from the king. Because the king, you could have a good king, but some of his soldiers are bad. You could have a talent king, yet some of his soldiers are, mashallah. But the heart, no. He is above the king. So he says that the king, he had the heart, is that if it's good, all the limbs are good. If it's bad, all the limbs are bad. So I make sure that my king is looked after. How can I do that? By not falling into the doubtful matters. By making sure that I am stabra, making a distance between me and that doubtful matter. This example can be seen from another hadith. This hadith where the Prophet ﷺ gives an example about Islam, the deen. He said, the example of the deen is like a sirat, path, which is mustaqim, straight. On the sides of this path, there is two fences. And in these two fences, there are doors, gates. And on each gate, there is a curtain which is stretched down. And there is a caller call at the beginning of the path. Keep straight, keep straight, so the people are going. And there is another caller over that, over the Sirah, which is say to them, be aware, don't go to one of these gates. So if you go into it, you're going to go straight through it. So that means don't look. So you've got people going to the Sirah, and you've got gates and you've got curtains. So when you pass, don't even look. Don't even look. Never mind, go in. Because if you look, you're about to go in. You're about to open the gate. You're about to enter through that curtain. So what is the Sirat? Prophet ﷺ said, this path is Islam. What is the caller? It's the Quran. Allah. What is the one which is over the Sirat calling? This is the heart. That every believer got, which we call it consciousness, which is every believer is got. This is the one who's telling you, be aware, don't go in. As soon as you go in, you're bound to go through the haram. So these fences, Prophet he said, the inviolables of Allah, the borders, don't cross them. Go on the path, don't cross these borders. Cross these borders, you go into haram. Now, this hadith is from Nu'man ibn Bashir. Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu an, is from the young companions. And when the Prophet وسلم, he died, he was only eight years old. And what we benefit from this hadith, number of things. Number one, that whatever is in the Sharia ah is to be divided into halal, clear, halal, haram, clear, and something which is in between. So many people they don't know about, and some they know. And that we also, also benefit from this, that we should not indulge into the doubtful matters until we know it is halal. So I can't eat the hyena until I've been told by somebody who I trust or I've read something that would tell me that it is halal. And also setting parables and examples is what the Prophet used to do to make things easier for the companions to understand and this as well should be followed by the teachers and the da'ya these days. Whenever they give something, they give an a, a, a illustration, demonstration, an example to make things clear. And also that when we find that the person go into the doubtful matters, he will dare himself to go into the haram. So if you dare yourself to go to the doubtful, I it's a doubtful matter, let me go. Then you will go to the haram. And also to show you the importance, Ya Ikhwani, of the heart. And the heart is the king. Okay, he's the king. He's the one where the tongue fishes. Uh, the tongue fishes from the heart. The heart is clean, the tongue will be sweet. The heart is not clean, you'll fish sewage. So imagine the heart is a lake. And that lake has got the water. This is where everything comes out of. How does the lake receive? You've got the hearing, the seeing, smelling. All of those goes into the heart. So if you hear good, see good, speak good, smell good, halal, then the heart will be clean and pure. 
So your tongue will fetch from mashallah, sweet words. But if it's vice versa, you hear bad, haram, see bad, haram, talk bad, everything bad, then this lake will be ruined and polluted. And that's why you end up corrupted. Khwani, the heart is the king of the limbs. And also we need to make sure that we understand this hadith that some people understand it on the other way around. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Allah in the taqwa hahuna, three times. And he pointed to his chest. Said, Verily, taqwa, piety, is where? In the heart. Three times. This heart is a two types. Either a heart which is a believer or a heart of a disbeliever. Heart of the disbeliever is a two, two parts. Either it's dead, completely kafir, or is a hypocrite. And the believer is either a heart which has got, mashallah, light into it, or a heart which we call it the diseased one. Two things goes into this heart. Stream of good, stream of bad. And he is to respond to the one which is the stronger current. If it's the good, it would be good. If it's the bad, it would be the bad. You would call it diseased heart. So this heart, when we say, the Prophet of Allah said, the taqwa is hahuna. Don't you ever understand this is to justify your evil deeds. We say to the brother, brother, for example, you need to make sure that you look like a Muslim. So come to the congregation prayer. Jamal, he would say, Akhi, al iman fil qalb. Belief is in the heart. What does that mean? So, yeah, yeah, even if I pray in the house, no problem. Brother, you need to adhere to the Prophet. He said, Grow your beard. See, the iman is in the heart. It doesn't have to be the beard. That is wrong, Yaqwan, to justify. Something which is wrong by saying, my heart is full of Iman, that is not correct. To make fatwa for yourself, as the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Stafti qalbak, nasa wa awtuk. Give or seek fatwa for your heart, even if you've been given fatwa from somebody. Let's say that you have asked for something which is like eating with a utensils made of pure gold or pure silver. That person says, I don't think it's any problem. But yourself, you find it, mm, I'm not relaxed. That heart of yours, if it's been injected with imam, is giving you the right fatwa. So don't listen to that person who's saying to you, listen to what? Your heart, which is full of taqwa, is injected with imam. That heart is the one going to tell you, don't approach. Whereas the heart is corrupted, it doesn't matter. No problem. Yeah, as long as you tell him anything, this is haram. Iman is the most important. I've got iman, yeah. I've got iman in my heart. If you've got Iman in your heart, it should reflect in your limbs. It should show that you are a person following what Allah says to you, do, and keep away from what Allah says to you, don't. That's the heart that will say, heart which is full of Iman. But to justify your crime, you say that Iman is in the heart, that is not acceptable. Coming up to the seventh hadith. <laughs> By the way, Akhwani, this hadith, if I want to explain it, it takes me away in two lectures. Even this hadith is a lecture upon it, which is the relationship between the outward and the inward. Do you understand that? The outward and the inward. The inward is linked to the outward. Yes, there are people who are against this principle. Like, for example, Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul, he looks good. He comes with a prayer. He's got a beard. He's got thought. But he's a hypocrite. He's in hellfire. Okay, so we're not saying to you fix your outward in order to fix your inward. No, we don't say that. But the Prophet ﷺ was keen to fix the outward because it's linked to the inward. But we don't say start to fix the outward. Do you understand the difference? But there's a link between the outward and the inward. For example, when the Prophet of Allah makes the Salat al Jama'ah, what did he do? He makes what? That the feet to feet, shoulder to the shoulder, in order to be what? Straight line. Prophet Allah said, Let us Look at that. Either you're straight in your rows 
or Allah will put a split. You'll become divided in your hearts. So that act, which is an outward act, feet to feet, shoulder to shoulder, in order to straighten the road, had affected the inward, which is what? Right. Number seven. Oh. Right, this again, this hadith is one of the great principles of Islam. Actually, you could make a khutbah out of this, just that hadith. But as I said, we can't really give a, a deep sort of very depth into depth explanation. But we'll do, inshallah, what is justifying. This is from the Jawani al Kalim, collective words. What is collective words? Words which are few in number, but they have vast meanings. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Uti to Jawami al Kalim. He said, I've been given six of the Prophets, other Prophets who hasn't been given. One of them, that Jawami al Kalim. Very few words, but they know a lot. They mean a lot. For example, those principles that we have learned, very few words. Subhanallah. You need books to explain that word. Ad-deen al-Nasiha. Ad-deen, the whole religion, is something to do with Nasiha, action. Something to do with action, al-Nasiha, sincere advice. Prophet said, al-Hajju, Arafah, two words. Hajj, most important pillar of it, Arafah, two words. Prophet said, said, Karimatan, Khafifatan, Ala lisan Taqilatani fil mizan, habibatani ila rahman, subhanallah, wa bihamdi, subhanallah, al -Azim. Look at that, how short it is. You know the long hadith of the Prophet, the authentic ones, there are about 30 plus, and that's it. The long hadith of the Prophet, which is like a page or so, it's only 30 plus, authentic ones. Whereas most of the hadith is what? Short. Because Prophet, he said, Uti to Allah gives me. Those words, which are few in number. But if you want to explain them, mashallah. Ad-deen nasiha So the Prophet Sallallahu he said that the foundation of this deen is based upon sincere advice. And in underneath which the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam comes in. And the hadith of the Prophet when he said, Al-Islam, Wal-Iman, Wal-Ihsan, all of that. So when the Prophet he said about Jibreel, if you remember the hadith, he said, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ جِبْرِيلْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Jibreel came to teach you your religion. طيب. Now, الدين النصيحة Here, it's been mentioned only once. There is another hadith which is authentic. In Mustakhraj Abiyah, Uwana, he said, Ad-Din Nasiha three times. So in Sahih Muslim, it's only once. But in other hadith, said, Ad-Din Nasiha, Ad-Din Nasiha, Ad-Din Nasiha. When the companions had heard this, and the Prophet of Allah is emphasizing it three times, and this is like showing the great sort of uh, words, and the Prophet of Allah is emphasizing it three times, they said, Liman ya Rasulullah, to whom this is not sincere advice. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned those five. Lillahi, wa li kitabihi, wa li rasulihi, wa li ammat al-muslimin, wa ammatihi. Five. To Allah, to his messenger, to the leaders, uh, sorry, to Allah, to his books, to his messenger, to his leaders, the leaders, which are the emirs, and the general people. Five. Those are the five that the Prophet Sallallahu came up with. So what does that mean? Al-Nasihatu Lillah. To give advice, sincere advice to Allah. What does that mean? That means you are monotheistic. You're worshipping Allah alone. You are attributing to Allah the highest of attributes, the good names, and asma al husn or sifatul ula, to obey Allah Azza wa Jal, and to worship Him with sincerity, and to love in His sake, hate in His sake, to make jihad, and to 
as well to jihad, those people who had disbelieved in the Almighty Azza wa Jal, to call for his sake. As for the nasiha for the book, is to believe in his books, to believe in the Quran, to believe that you should exalt this Quran and implement what it says to you, whether it is do or don't, to understand it, to contemplate this ayat and not to alter it. As for the sincere advice to his prophet, and that is to be believing in what he had brought and to respect the prophet and with sheer reverence and to hold on to his obedience and to revive his sunnah and to study it and to have enmity to the ones who have enmity to the prophet and his sunnah and to have allegiance to the prophet and his sunnah and to the ones who have allegiance and looks up to the prophet and his sunnah and to try to imitate his manners and to etic have the etiquettes where possible following the prophet to love his family, love his companions. All of that comes under sincere advice of the prophets. Now we come into the fourth one. Sincere advice to the imams of the Muslims, to the leaders, by helping them to establish the haqq and to follow them as long as they ask you to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to correct them, but not openly, not in front of everybody whenever they make a mistake, and to do that with sympathy and with mercy, and to supplicate that Allah Azza wa Jal will put them on the right path, and not to provoke the people against them. As for their general advice for the people, that is to show them what is their maslaha. I should have said actually the advice of the general layman is to actually not to provoke him against their leaders, and as for the leaders, not to provoke them against the people whom they are leading. So, and also to this, not to disclose their privacy and also to champion them, help them, and also to not to envy or cheat and all of these things and to love for them what you love for yourself from the good and to hate for them what you hate for yourself from the bad and all of that. Also, what we learn from this hadith is the importance of the advice and its place in the deen. And also, to whom is the advice? To Allah, his book, messenger, and the leaders, and the ones who are the general people. And also, to uh, show the companions keenness. They are keen to know their deen by asking the Prophet of Allah, what to whom is the Nasiha, Messenger of Allah? And also that the deen is being called now by a Nasiha, which is something to do with an action. So the deen is being called as a Nasiha. Eight hadith. Number eight, uh, the quantity of the Muslim. But so this hadith also from the principles. How can the person enter Islam? Now look, Umar is the son of who? Umar al-Khattab radiallahu Now Umar al-Khattab, he had a debate regarding this hadith with Abu Bakr when he was the Khalifa. When the Prophet sallam died, Abu Bakr who? Was the leader and the Khalifa. Straight away, those Arabs or around the Medina who did not embrace Islam uh, with strength and they were waiting for anything to happen, some of them committed apostasy. And some of them did not commit apostasy but refused to pay zakah and they thought this is tax only to be paid to Muhammad Sallallahu the Prophet of Allah to die, who don't pay it. When Abu Bakr decided 
to fight them. Umar radiallahu anhu arda, okay, he debated Abu Bakr, saying to him, basically, how can you fight the people when those people who had prevented the zakah, they testify that is la ilaha illallah. Yaqulu la ilaha illallah. And the Prophet they said, I have been commanded by the Almighty to fight the people until they say la ilaha illallah. So he who says la ilaha illallah, he had protected his wealth and himself. That means his wealth and his blood and his wealth, except if it's a due right, illa bi and their accountant is upon Allah Azza wa Jal. Abu Bakr, he said, by Allah, I will fight the one who had differentiated between Salah and Zakah. For well, the Zakah is the due right of the money. And by Allah, if they to prevent me, a tether, which they tie the camel with, that they used to give it as a Zakah to the Prophet, and they prevent me to give it to me, then I will fight them for preventing that tether of the camel to me. Umar Khattab, he said, by Allah, I thought that this is that what Allah Azza wa showed to Abu Bakr is to be the haqq, and he opened his chest for it, so I knew it is the haqq. Have you noticed in this hadith where the debate took place, it doesn't mention that the Prophet Sallam were commanded, said, I've been commanded to fight the people until they say, La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah, and what? Establish the prayer, and what? Establish the zakat. Whereas when Umar, he said, how can you, Abu Bakr, fight the people when they are testifying la ilaha illallah? He did not mention the what? The prayer, nor he mentioned what? Zakat. What does that mean? What, what, what I mean? I mean, do we say, for example, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, well, he's the narrator of the hadith, he's the son of Umar al-Khattab. Why didn't he tell his father? You know, no father, but actually, Prophet of Allah, he said not just the shahadatayn, salah and zakat, to fight the people. He didn't say to his father. Some scholars said maybe he was not present. He was not there in the debate. But the correct opinion, ya ikhwani, and I need to answer this question, call for my mother. Yalla, yalla. Assalamu alaikum. Allah barik fikir. Tell dark, it's dark. Yalla. Uh, right. So coming back. Uh, what did I say? Right. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "I commanded the people to fight the people to say la ilaha illallah and salah and zakah." The Lai ibn Umar united this hadith. He never told his father Abu Bakr, uh, Umar, he shouldn't really debate with Abu Bakr because he's correct because he says the salah and the zakah. Is it because Abu Umar Abdullah ibn Umar was not present? No. We'll tell you this something is a principle very important. And that is that first, that some companions, okay, they might not know a particular sunnah. So we cannot just say that uh, this sunnah, it cannot be correct because how can it be correct? If so and so did not ha, uh, basically implement it, don't do that. That's not wrong. Do you understand that? So maybe Umar Khattab did not know about it. Maybe Abdullah ibn Umar. But we have to say that if there is something there, we know it's haq. We can't say it is, cannot be haq because such and such person did not implement it. Because this is not a hujjah for you to say this is wrong. You understand that? This is not a hujja for you to say it's wrong. Once it's established by the Quran or the Sunnah or some of the companions, then you cannot say why such and such companion did not do it. So it should be wrong. No. Because some of the great companions, they don't even know one of the easiest Sunnah that you know. Like, for example, Tayammu. You know about Tayammu? Yeah, you know about Tayammu. Well, Umar al-Khattab did not believe that there's a tam. He thought this is only water. Water can't do tam. Tam will grab lucian. And that his student as well, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, same thing. He didn't believe this tam. 
He didn't know. But when he had heard later on from him that the hadith of Ammar ibn Yasir, radiallahu an, when he had made roll himself in the sand, he made a tayammum by having a bath, not of water, of sand. He rolled himself. Okay, he rolled himself. And that hadith he reminded him, Umar Khattab, he said, okay, if you think it is correct and you've heard it from the Prophet, I'll give that to you. So I haven't heard it, but I will submit to what you said because he said this is a prophet. So Umar did not know about tayammum. Umar radiallahu an did not know about tayammum. Abdullah ibn Umar, who is so close to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that would implement everything that the Prophet of Allah he does, but it's been narrated for him to he does something that the Prophet of Allah did not do. Whenever he makes wudu, he puts water in his eyes. We're not going to follow that, Allah no one, because the Sunnah does not say mention that. So what I'm just saying, not every Sunnah, well, even if not every companion knows about every Sunnah. Some of the Sunnah are not known. So Umar al-Khattab radiallahu an didn't know the Hadith of the Prophet that had been commanded to fight the people and they say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and establish the prayer and give the zakah. They have to establish the prayer. So there has to be a prayer jama'ah, and that's why the Prophet وسلم, will wait before he invade the land. If there's a call of the Adhan, then he will pass by them. If there's no call of the Adhan, then he's what? There's no prayer. He will fight. Same thing with the zakah. And the zakah here is not the hidden zakah, because there's an open zakah and there's hidden zakah. The open zakah, the, uh, we should call it the, um, the zakah that is kind of, it has to be taken, is the zakah for the cattle, for the land, for the crops. Ooh. Not the zakat of the gold and the silver, the money. No, no, that's for you to pay, pay it. That's for you to calculate it. Nobody's allowed to go to your account, for example, you know how much money you've got. You have to pay the certain zakat, but not. In the one which we can see, like the crops, like the cattle. So if you have a number, certain number of cattle that you have to pay a zakat for, then you must pay it to the estate, the Islamic estate. Fine. Also, there are exceptions for those people who don't fight. So we said we fight the people till they say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and establish the prayer, zakah. But there's an exception we don't find those who do not say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Do not pray, do not pay zakah. They are the people of what? Jizya. The one who are disbelievers, Christian, Jews, any, live under the Islamic state, but they pay the tribute. Like we pay the zakah, they pay a tribute. They don't say la ilaha illallah, they don't believe in it. But yet we don't fight them because they are Ahlul Jidya and those being mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wasallam. It is enough for the person to become a Muslim is to say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasul. It's the first thing incumbent upon a person to go into the deen. Okay. Now, after that, if he doesn't pray the zakah, it doesn't mean zakah. So remember, if he does not pay the zakah, he's not a kafir. He's a kafir if he doesn't believe there's a zakah. The difference. If he doesn't pay his zakah, it will be taken from him whether he likes it. We will fight it for him. We will fight for it to give the zakah. You have to give the cattle zakah. You have to give the crops zakah. But it's not a kafir. We'll fight. So the, Abu Bakr, when he fought, he did not fight all of them kuffar. He fought some of them are kuffar. And some of them that are Muslim, they don't want to pay what? The zakah. What we gain from this hadith that to fight until we get the shahadatain, salah zakah, and of course, if they are not to embrace Islam, then we will ask for them to pay the tribute. Uh, also, this hadith tells us that there will be hisab on the day of resurrection. Because the, here the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Qan. وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And their account is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Third, fourthly, we, we believe here as well that we can gain that he who would prevent it to pay the zakah, he will be fought until he pays the zakah. Um, and he who presents Islam, it will be accepted from him even if it's from outward. So if he's a hypocrite from inside, we leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number nine, hadith. Okay, we, 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 let me just stop here, inshallah. 
And we'll uh, first of all, before we start with the class, with the questions, uh, we have decided to make the class only one, uh, which is after Isha prayer, regardless of the time of the Isha. So now the time of Isha, mashallah, it's six o'clock. So quarter past six, we will start with our class all the time, even in there. Um, uh, there was before two classes for me on this day. I have to, you know, travel from here was so fast to go to else we give another class. I've canceled that class and I shifted it to another day for me to relax with you if you want to ask questions and all of this. And I think it's more convenient for me to have it after Isha. True or not? Yeah. Yes or not? Hmm. He's not saying anything. <laughs> I never say anything. No, no. You know, you didn't say anything because everybody say yes. What do you think? No, no. What do you say? <laughs> Politics. You like it, Aisha? You like it, Aisha? Yeah, I like it. Yeah, Aisha, yes. Aisha, as I said, I'm relaxed because before I was not relaxed. I had to look at the time when I'm going to go, when I'm going to leave. No, I don't have to. So you have me now. You can eat me as much as you want. No, no, of course. Not going to be 9, 10, I'm going to be here. No. We will be will be after Maghrib then, because Maghrib will be early. Oh. When we have Isha at 10 o'clock, we'll have Maghrib about 7 o'clock. So we'll be after Maghrib. You'll we'll adjust it accordingly. Yes, of course. After Isha during the winter, of course. Winter time. So Isha is going to be 11 o'clock. We're going to have after 11. <laughs> Come on. This is common sense. <laughs> but we'll be after Maghrib. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> I've got questions on the Zoom and you don't have a question from here. Father. When witness. When somebody he takes a shahada, he's a witness. No, the witness is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for us to treat him as a Muslim, for us to bury him in a Muslim cemetery, for us to, uh, you know, because of things that are going to be dealt with as a Muslim, a certificate will be handy. But it's not... Unto the Almighty, as we will, Allah will say, ask him, what is your certificate? You can't be accepted in Jannah unless you bring a certificate. Stamped by, for example, Islamic Center in Bedford. No, no. There will be no such thing. But a certificate is for you to gain, for example, access to go to Mecca. Uh, anybody can go to Mecca now. <laughs> but before, you could have to have well, Islamic certificate that you got to go as a Muslim. Okay, to Mecca. And also to marry a Muslim lady. If you're a male, can't marry a non-Muslim. So you have to have a certificate. And also, if your families too, if they are not a revet and they're still disbelievers, and if you to die, uh, the, your brothers of yours, to for, for them to bury Islamically, they have to have a piece of paper to argue on your behalf to bury you in the Muslim cemetery. Otherwise, you're going to be married on the non-Muslim cemetery. So this certificate is handy, but it's not a condition for you to be in Jannah. No, you don't have to witness. Your witness is Allah. You don't have to witness. This is not marriage. This is Islam. But as I said, when you have the certificate, alhamdulillah, it's enough. It's a witness in itself. Okay? You have other people to know about it. Alhamdulillah. Fine. Now, I'll share with you a story. Uh, that happened recently um, on Jumwa about two days ago. Uh, after I've done a khutbah, I went to witness and participate in the graduation of my son. And it was, I'm not going to mention the city because it's going to affect the person I'm going to mention the story. And it was a university. And uh, I was with my wife and daughter and son-in-law to celebrate with the person. And you know that how they make the graduation ceremonies here. It's like, you know, pianos and a plane and they move and, you know, in the hall and you know, they make things out of it. And uh, there was in front next to my wife, this lady, she's standing up, she's looking at me, and I looked at her, and subhanAllah, I could see that her face is full of light, iman. 
uh, but she was not covered. She was uh, modestly dressed, but she's not covered. She had as well something in her face that tells me that she's an Asian, like, you know, one of these studs in her nose. And she was told that I am the father by my wife of my son. So she was so happy. I don't know what has happened. And there was a new that her son is actually to be graduating along with my son together. When they marched forward after they had given graduation to the ones which are above the MSA degree, MSc degree and all of this, and came to the one which is a postgraduate. And because my son is uh, name wise, begins with A and even the family comes A and B. So he's the number one. <laughs> he's number one from those 50 people or more. So he's been honored, this bachelor. Now, every person who's been honored claps, shouting, hallelujah, whatever it is, and even whistling. When my son got it, Allahu Akbar! <laughs> as, as much as I can, I shook the whole hall. Twice. I think the person in front of me took, took the ground. No, he did not. Well, at the beginning of the, the chancellor, he had said, whatever greeting you're going to do is acceptable. So some of the greetings were shouting, some of them clapping, some of them clapping with shouting. And 80% or plus, even more than 80%, I'm not exaggerating, the one graduated are from Muslim countries. Especially the ones with MSc degree, PhD degree. They are from Muslim. Muhammad, Abdullah, Abdullah, Muhammad, Muhammad, Sabrina, all of the Muslim, Muslim names. SubhanAllah. Yet, the single word that is related to the deen is being said. So when I said it, one person, yeah, it was with shy. Allah Akbar. <laughs> shy. Reminds me of the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu The one who's holding to his deen is like holding to the burning coal. He's shy of his deen. One brother was from an ex ZY country, Muslim. He looked at me and said, <laughs> You never heard it before. Inshallah, it will be the trend later on. The people will copy. And even outside, they can be, Oh, yes, Yakallah, khayran. Was everybody shy? Why are you shy with deen? Why the word Allahu Akbar wa lillahi alham is linked to terrorism these days? It's either because of the media polluted this or because of the sick people who are in our clan, Muslims, who had polluted this name, polluted this saying of Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar wa lillahi alham. So I said it twice, alhamdulillah, and it's been recorded. This is not the story. The story is that Later on, when I was in the house, I was told that this person who was with my son, whom his mother was there, he was a Hindu. They come from a country. I'm not going to say that country, but he was a Hindu. And because he's with my son and the friend of, his, of my son, Muslims, he became a Muslim. This is not the story. <laughs> so before he utters the shahada, my son is telling me, he said to me, I want to sign. This Hindu, you want to sign. I said, well, when are we going to give you a sign? There's no such thing as sign. He went to his house and he wanted to, now he's bracing Islam secretly. His father doesn't know, his mother doesn't know. So the weakest element of the two is the mother. So you're going to tell his mother. So he says to his mother, you know, I've been, uh, I've looked and, I, and I've been, well, I think Islam is correct and I want to embrace Islam. Do you mind? His mother started crying. She said to him, I've been a Muslim for one year, but I didn't want to tell you, and I've been making dua to Allah for you to make Muslim Islam. The reason why she's not dressed up, because the husband is not a Muslim, he doesn't know about both of them. That's why I can't say the name of the university because it's going to be online. The reason that this man still, I have seen him, husband, is not a Muslim. He doesn't know about the embracement of Islam of his wife nor his son. And yet he has suspicion. Studying my son, the one who graduated, 
is forcing him and his mother to eat pork because they're suspecting his wife they are Muslims. Make dua for them, Ikhwan. And I was really impressed with these two. And that's why I refer to the light I've seen on that sister, mashallah, tabarakallah. When she looked, she doesn't look one of those people who belong to non Islamic faith. Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. And she was so happy that her son is with my son. And uh, uh, she treats my son as well as her son, subhanAllah. Bye. Any questions? You're cold, aren't you? <laughs> yes. You could come to this heater, mashallah. I'm very warm. Bye. Any questions? Sure. Father. Uh, so, uh, you know the halal and haram. Yeah? Halal and haram. Certain seafood. Seafood. Certain seafood. Yeah, Certain yeah. seafood. What do you like? Sushi? No, I like shrimp and uh, shrimps. Nice. Uh, and like huh? Prawns and lobster. Prawns, very nice. Lobster, mashallah, very, no. very expensive and nice. Yeah. <laughs> no, somebody told me that it's haram. Certain seafood is haram. What, like, what sort of set of uh, seafood he told you is haram? Prawns and prawns has haram. haram. Tell him this person is actually uh, needs to be quiet. <laughs> I'm not that to say anything in the deen because he's now like <laughs> you can never say anything haram unless you have what proof because when you say something haram the effect of that is devastating you cannot say because you're going to make people indulge into what they believe is halal is to make them think that they are doing haram where's your proof where the prophet sallallahu He'd been asked by the companions, Messenger of Allah, we go in the sea, that means with a boat, and we carry let little water with, it, with us. If we use it for our wudu, we'll have no water to drink. So the Prophet وسلم, he said, the sea water that is a, that is the water is pure and has the ability to purify. So use it for wudu. Don't use your normal water for drinking. That means the dead animals in it is to be halal. The dead animals, that means not the dead animals as in you find fish which is floating on top of the sea, they've been dead for these days, they're rotten, they're not halal. That means when you bring the fish live, you don't have to slaughter it. So you just, after a while, it becomes what? Dead. You're not allowed from the fish tank onto the frying pan. Haram. So it's moving because some of the restaurants they do that, the posh restaurant. Which fish do you want? Jumps into the pan. That's haram to eat because you killed it while it's alive. It has to die first. Okay, and then you fry. All seafood is halal except what is being proved to be poison. But it's not the whole animal is haram. You take the poison out and you eat the animal. There is, you know, called the rockfish. You hear about the rockfish? You step on it, it's got poison in it. Take that poison out and eat the rockfish. No problem. So everything is called snake, eels, uh, sea snakes, eels, halal. But the land snakes, haram. Fish, the uh, shark, uh, yeah. whales, uh, whatever you want. So who says haram? I think I don't think he's tasted the shrimps. That's why he says haram. Maybe. <laughs> but uh, what else? I've asked you for the elephant and the crocodile. Halal or haram? Let's go to the elephant. Halal or haram? Yalla. You could say mistakes now, no problem. I'll, I'll correct. <laughs> Halal? Doubtful matter. For you, it's doubtful matter. I'll stay away. Well, oh, good. But now you could, I'm just saying, give you the chance to gamble. <laughs> Halal gambling. So if you had a crocodile, would you eat, sorry, had an elephant, would you eat it? Right. The elephant, now remember, what are the things makes the animal haram? If he's killing by a claw, it's haram. If he's got canines and kills by them, 
حرام it's got fangs the snake حرام okay right so the claws like the vultures the eagle the uh, falcon so حرام to eat chicken it's got claws it's halal why because it does not kill with the claws it kills with what with the beak you understand with the other one that's how they snatch with the claws it's haram so little birds pigeons halal as for the ones who've got canines like dogs any animal has got canines fox it's got canines small ones but it's got canines haram roof haram except for the hind is halal Subhanallah. What? Allah made it for us hot. And it's close to the, we call it the rotten, the remainder, the remaining, the horrible thing. And yet the digesting system of it makes it so nice that his meat is good. I haven't tasted it, but I've seen people who tasted it. Now the elephant. We know that he's vegetarian, you know that. Okay, right. Does he use his tusk for hunting? Yes or no? If it is yes, then it's haram. If it is not, it's halal. If you're not sure, then it is doubtful matter. And I'll tell you what, scholars have defined different between these. He kills actually by his foot. He steps on it, he kills it. He's going to kill, but he's not a hunt. He hunts, does not hunt with tusk. Elephant, we cannot say it's haram. No, we cannot say it's haram. Halal. Crocodile. Crocodile is a cross between the sea, river, and the land. Now, we say now, is it halal or haram? Some scholar this is halal. Some scholars say it's haram. Depending upon, number one, is it from the sea animals? You know, the Prophet he said, Al Okay? Or is it from the land animal? Because he goes in the land as well to have some sun tan, you know, sometimes he goes outside for sun tanning and <laughs> capturing things. <laughs> and he's got a big, massive canine. You see him, it's the... Yeah, he eats with me. Uh, I wouldn't say it's haram, but I would not say it's halal because, as I said, this is a very controversial animal. Shubhat. <laughs> One of them is, we could say now, either it's halal haram, is the hippo. <laughs> I have seen people who in my class were eating hippos. Yeah, yeah, they're because in Africa. And they say it's nice meat. And by the way, they live in the sea. They don't live outside. They're always called faras and nahr. Hippo. And you know the most ones who've been killed in Africa, they're not from snakes. Not by crocodiles. It's by hippos. The hippos, they live in the same territory of the crocodiles. You know that. But the hippo is stronger. And that is a family. Not like the crocodiles. So, what, for example, the hippo has been seen like saving a, a deer. It's been captured by the crocodile. They came all together and they pushed the scared the crocodile off and they released that. You've seen that, you know. And they've released that... Uh, that uh, deer, subhanAllah. But he's the one that kills because he's got these massive, you've seen them how long it is, the two canine, no, canine tusks, whatever they call them. Oh, it's massive, subhanAllah. Uh, he is because he's from the sea animal, we don't use the rule of the tusk. We don't use the rule of the canines. He's a sea animal, he does not be lived. So if you put him outside, he'll die. He has to leave all, it has to have some moist onto his skin, otherwise he'll die. So that is, we say it is halal. Hippo is all within the river. It is halal, and as I said, I met people who edit, and they say it's nice, according to them, the taste, of course. Huh? Fishing with explosive. I mean, they put explosive in the sea, and then the fish comes out. If it's fresh fish, no problem. But if you have made the explosion, you collected the fish which is fresh, 
And after two days, he came and still fish there and dead. You can't eat it because of rot. Rotten is not allowed. Bye. Alhamdulillah. Go to now the uh, ones on the online. Zuhra, Fadl. You have to allow them, Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. So, my question is about inheritance. Say, for example, my parents die and I'm living in the house they left behind and I've been living there since I was born. So, I've lived there, say, like 40 odd years. I also looked after my parents. So, now my siblings, they want their share. I find it really difficult to move out. So I go to the bank and I get a mortgage against this house and I give my siblings their shares from this mortgage loan and I pay the mortgage back with the riba. Is that in inheritance for my siblings? Is it halal for them to take it or not? Sister? Sorry, you. I think you were muted. Oh, I was like, Sister, can you just repeat the question? Because uh, we didn't hear the question here. What is this? So in, it, my question is about inheritance. So my yeah. parents die. I'm living in the house they leave behind. I've been living there, say, for example, 45 years. I help to look after my parents as well until this, they this die. This question, Sister, basically is a, a personal question, isn't it? Um, yes. Okay, the personal question, we're going to be, inshallah, if you put them into me under the WhatsApp, I will answer it because it might be, you know, it's a personal one, so it needs more details. It's not just a simple yes or no, halal or haram. Okay? Okay. All right. Jazakallah khairan. Ahmed. Jazakallah khairan, Shaykhana. Shaykhana, what is the authenticity of the hadith uh, that a, pers uh, a person who prays in his house is better than a person who prays in this mosque of mine except for the maktuba yeah this hadith is authentic that is praying in the house is better than praying in the masjid of mine which is masjid of medina of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to show you that the importance of praying in the house compared to the praying the prayer of the sunnah in the masjid so always pray your sunnah where at home and it's equivalent in terms of reward wise just like praying the obligatory in the masjid of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it would be multiplied you pray that way now yalla ya abu faluda assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah shaykhana did i pronounce your name correctly no yes uh, is crab halal to eat crab you know what's a crab Crab, is Some it the sea animal or, or is it land animal? Sea animal. Halal. Halal. It looks Halal. horrible. Yeah. It's uh, very tasty, Chef. No, but it looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's like similar to the lobster. No. The lobster is more tasty. Oh, no. The lobster is the best. But the lobster, you don't get so much meat out of it. Unfortunately. You know, yeah, but it's very nice. Uh, the crabs and the seashells, the crabs the seashells as well. Mm. I went to Spain and their food is most of it is seafood. I have seen all sorts of food. See, I've, I've, I've seen a feast of seafood. Okay, I've eaten the best one is actually the octopus soup. Yeah, octopus soup with a, a white octopus, white meat. Uh, I, I, if you had told me it's octopus, I will not eat it. After eating, they said to me, it's octopus. Because it will stop me from eating. So what's that? Shark fin. Shark fin. No. Sword, like a sword, is it? Shark fin. Yeah. The fin of the shark. Yeah, the tail, they mean the tail. Shark fin. Yeah, but I've seen a shark was uh, to be sold in Manchester. It was scary. <laughs> it was scary, subhanAllah. Now. Win appetit. <laughs> Anybody? Question? Fadl? You have to have the question here. Yeah. The question is, 
0.05% or less. Is it permissible to drink? You know, this is uh, uh, labeled as alcohol-free. But the so fuss in this in these countries, you know, who does them, they present you even with that. And it's called alcohol-free. We have a principle by which we know halal haram. Whatever, too much of it. Makes you drunk, the little bit of it is what happened. So if some if you're doing so much of something, makes you drunk, then a little bit of it you drop, it's haram to drink. Even if you cook with it. <laughs> so this thing that you have just asked about, which is less than 0.05 percent. If you drink, let's say it's a can. Of beer. If you drink about 10 cans, would you get drunk? Would you drink 20 cans? Would you get drunk? I know you're going to get burst, <laughs> but would you get drunk? No, because it's called alcohol free. What is the sign by which you could distinguish in, in such countries, like here, for example, is that be aware if you drink, you get drowsy. Because by law, they have to tell you if you drink, for example, non alcoholic, but it does make you dizzy. They have to say by law that it will get you drowsy because you might drive a, drive a car and make an accident. And then you can sue them. But they have to declare even that. You know, the orange juice, it has that percentage, 0.05%. So we're we going to have orange as well, haram. So this is called alcohol free. Regardless of how much you drink from it, it will not affect you. So it is halal. It is halal and halal, no problem about it, inshallah. Now, uh, this question leads me to a number of issues as well, just to understand. Um, I wouldn't really start drinking in front of everybody the beer which is alcohol free because people they don't know if it's alcohol free or not. And you're going to cause trouble for yourself to you drink it. It's in your house, nobody knows, yes, but front of people imagine i've got now a bottle of now a beer which is alcohol free big flag. Uh, <laughs> i have a big flag i'm also i was drinking beer it's not correct all right and i as well they put it in a bottle which looks like this real stuff they imitate subhanallah the real stuff the color of the bottle the looks of the bottle and yet, also, when you go to buy them, uh, if the, the machine will make a sound, you know, the cash machine or the one with the cashier, they will make a sound. So why is it making a sound? You have to authorize it. Even that has to be authorized. So I said, if it's alcohol-free, why need to be authorized? He said, there's some people, psychological, psychological sort of stuff, they might get drunk on it. Do you understand? You treat it like psychological. <laughs> to drink on it and that's why yes subhanallah it's, an, it's amazing um, one day uh, I remember when I was in this country in the beginning which was 19 I can't remember 80s I went to Asda that's in Manchester and I was drinking I was uh, used to buy it's called ginger beer but in bottles, and it's very cheap those days, 25 pence for the whole two liter. And but I used to buy them, mashallah, it's very nice, ginger beer, ginger beer, because it's ginger. But then I was out of curiosity, I don't read, because I take it from the soft thing, you know the soft one is Coke, it's not in the section of the album. <laughs> so I, I, I out of curiosity, I was looking here, such and such, the, uh, the ingredients, the contents, it says less than 0.05, percent of ABV. I don't know what is ABV. Yeah. Alcohol barrel value, value volume. I didn't know that. So I ring the customer service of ASDA, which is the main customer service for all ASDA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm I'm drinking this, and it's just less than 0.05 percent. 
percent. I didn't know about this alcohol field. But what is ABV? So she put me on hold. She said, okay, let me just ask. She got back. She said, means alcohol barrel. I said, what? Alcohol? She said, no, 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 but this is alcohol field. She said, it doesn't matter for me. I said, it's alcohol. It shouldn't be ABV. It should be clear for me, alcohol. And then I'll decide whether I'm going to take it or not. I can't remember within one week or two weeks, I go to the ASDA. Now, because of my question, all of them have been changed, no ABV now anymore. Alcohol barrel volume. They were scared. Just from one call. <laughs> this is talking about thousands and millions of bottles. SubhanAllah. Because they're really worried. So they're like, I'm a Muslim. I didn't know it's halal. Why should be alcohol? We should be alcohol. Not ABV. So everything has got alcohol and in it, even if it's mouthful, they would say what? Alcohol. They don't give you, for example, letters. They don't give you, no, no. You don't put EE36, EEC, whatever this stuff. No, they put you alcohol. So the alcohol has to be shown there. And gelatine has to be shown there as well. Gelatine, pork, gelatine, you know, whatever. Gelatine has to be shown as well. Now, uh, problem. Spirit vinegar, spirit vinegar, anything vinegar, halal. Spirit vinegar, white spirit vinegar, white, whatever, dark, anything, spirit, spirit wine vinegar. When it's vinegar, it's the opposite of the alcohol. Opposite. So it's halal. Halal. Spirit white vinegar, even worse word name. I'll give you the worst name. Spirit white, a white spirit vinegar. Huh? Red wine vinegar. Red wine vinegar. Okay. It's vinegar is the opposite of the alcohol. And that's why you find it in the section of the soft. You don't find it in alcohol. Anything alcohol has to be in the section of alcohol. It has to be in the section of alcohol. Even the non-alcoholic beer is in the section of alcohol. No. Okay. They tell some sweet. Uh, in the ingredients, it's uh, uh, one of the ingredients is alcohol, but it's just uh, sweet. If any sweets or any ice cream or any cake is got alcohol in it, keep away from it. It doesn't say less than point five. They say don't take it. Champagne in it, especially in Christmas these days, they have it. Streets, sweets, uh, yes, all of these keep away from them. You don't want them. It's got alcohol. Mouth wash. Mouth wash. By the way, the alcohol in itself is pure. That means if you've got alcohol in your hand, it doesn't mean you can't pray. You could pray. Okay? The alcohol impurity is when you drink it. Okay? Now, the alcohol has got something extra, the prohibition of it, is that it's not just the drinking of it, even to be close to it. Okay? So, we say as the essence of the alcohol is pure. No, it's not impure. It's pure. If you touch alcohol, no problem. But to use this alcohol in any sort of form, whether it is for, you know, what is called that? Uh, no, hand cream, the hand wash, we say sanitization. No. Or you use it for mouthwash. If that alcohol in it, if it to be drink, drank, is to be making you drunk, then I can't use it. Remember, it's the haram of the alcohol. It's not just to drink it, even to be close to it. So if that in the mouthwash is an alcohol that if you drink it, it makes you get you drunk, I'm not allowed to use it, even external usage, even for sanitization, killing germs and all of that. Somebody said to me, the methanol and ethanol is as follows. The ethanol is the expensive one. The methanol is the is poisonous one. It's not alcoholic. It does not give you drowsy. So it's two, methanol and ethanol. If the methanol is the one comprises the ingredients of stuff like cleaning windows, cleaning woods, and all of this, and it's halal to use. And our Sheikh al-Albani was so pleased when he had somebody told him this ethanol, methanol, because all these detergents, they have some sort of uh, so, uh, 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 a branch of the alcohol, whether it's methanol or ethanol. But the methanol is not something to get you drunk. It will kill you. It's poison. 
So poison is no problem to have. So if you have poison, something you're drinking to kill yourself. So poison for external usage, no problem. So you have an antidote poison snake, no problem. Do you understand me? Poison in certain quantities to be antidote for another poison of a snake, no problem. Halal. But the alcohol in all sorts of shape and form is haram, which is the ethanol. It's the ethanol. So too much of it makes you drunk, then a little bit of it is haram. That's the difference. No. As we go to the format that we buy food that all most of the time we understand the vegetarian vegan we take it as a halal. But because they are not present for animals, the presence they of what? No presence of any animal like a genetically no anything. But uh when it could be uh to any alcohol stuff, is there any way we can identify the mission to not alcoholic? Or is there... If there is any item that's got alcohol, by law, they have to tell you. So you don't take it. So anything which is suitable for vegetarians, suitable for vegans, it's halal for you to eat. But you just said to me now, gelatine. Kwani gelatine is not alcohol. Gelatine is halal. Halal. There's no haram into it. Whether it is pork gelatine, animal gelatine, any gelatine is called gelatine. Gelatine is chemically processed, is not carrying the original stuff of it. It's being processed completely. Okay? It's like a, a poo has been turned, turned, into, turned into charcoal. This poo, you have baked it and you made it into charcoal. I don't say it's made of poo that can't touch it because the poo is gone now. It became fahma, charcoal, a coal. This is gelatin being processed completely the identity of the material is being changed. So we don't look how is, what is the origin of it. And not cooking here. No, chemically it's being changed. <laughs> chemically it's being changed. So I wouldn't buy to my children something called pork gelatin. It's not because haram to eat. It's because I don't want them to get used to the word pork. But for you to eat it, no problem. No problem. And I'll tell you what, they call it, for example, vegetarian gelatin and the meat gelatin, ask me, because I taste both. The one which has got the real gelatin is tastier, and much tastier than the one, they call it halal gelatin. Like Haribo. Taste the Haribo, which is the one got vegetarian gelatin. And no one has got animal gelatin. They don't tell you it's, you know, it's bovin. They call it bovin. There's no pork. It's called gelatin. That one which is not halal is much tastier than one which is, they say, is halal. It's in Islam, it's much tastier. It's got the taste of my sweets. But if it's got the word pork, I will not buy it for my children. Because I don't want to get my children used to it. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Any other questions from here, Khwani? Tfadal. I use... Uh... I used to get uh, tablet, tablet, and, uh, capsules from the doctor. But you can see for me the for gelatin. I do ask if I can have tablet or the capsule. No problem. The capsule has got poor gelatin. No problem. Gelatin is no problem for you. But don't tell your children I'm going to have poor gelatin. Okay, so no problem. Um, Ahmed Sharif, there's a question. A person said that he saw a non mahram woman by accident, and then he made a statement that he didn't do anything haram, it was halal. His friend advised him, Don't say it's halal, say it's forgiven. Sheikh, please clarify. I don't understand the question. <laughs> he's, he's saying that he saw a, a non mahram woman by accident. And then he said to his friend, I didn't do anything haram, this is halal. And his friend advised him, don't say it's halal, say it's forgiven. And they're saying, Sheikh, please what, what clarify. Is story? I mean, why is that story and related to the whole thing? Makes me. So what is the statement that you want? Just forget about the story. Sorry, it's not really. His statement is that he saw a woman by accident, a non-mahram woman. And he said Sheikh, that. What did he say? What did he say? Regardless he said, of... I didn't do anything haram, it was halal. That was his statement. Haram, halal, of what? Seeing the girl, you mean or what? Uh, that's what he's asking you. Okay, I, I can't understand the question. Believe me, Ahmed, it's difficult for me to understand. And I think it's so obvious an answer, so I can't really give you the answer. 
So I don't, I don't understand what is the mushkila, what is the problem here. Anyway, this is not a beneficial question. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, ashadu allah, tasafiru, zakabullah, khayran, barakabatuh.